Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Um, happy National Invasive Species Awareness Week and Florida Weed, Wrang Weed Wrangle Week. Um, I'm looking forward to uh, giving you guys some great updates about what's going on this week um, nationally and in Florida. Um, so thank you for joining us. <clears throat> Just really quickly before we get into our main presentation today, um, a quick agenda overview. Um, welcome, as I mentioned, and um, our big our presentation today is very timely, um, given some of the recent news about um, the expansion of rhesus macaque populations in the state, as well as some other issues related to uh, the transmission of diseases via wildlife. Um, so very um, happy and honored to have Dr. Samantha Wisely, as she's going to present um, primarily talking about the issue of feral hog related diseases, but also provide some information on some other um, mammals we have here in the state. Um, following that, as I mentioned, we've got some great updates on our NISA and Florida Weed Wrangle Week activities. Um, so just a quick note, in the chat box, you will find some links um, that may be helpful. Um, these are some links that we'll share during the updates. Um, so you should be able to just copy and paste those right out of the chat box um, for use. Also, as we're going through the presentation with Dr. Wisely, if any questions come up um, throughout the presentation, please go ahead and um, type those in the chat box and we will um, share them at the end of her presentation. Um, and we'll offer that opportunity uh, at the end of the presentation as well. So with that, um, I want to go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Wisely. Let me make sure we can hear her and she should have control. All right, Dr. Wisely, over to you. Great. Thank you very much, Emily. Can you hear me? I can. Great. So, um, well, first of all, thank you so much uh, to the CISMA for um, having me um, talk to you a little bit about what my lab research is and also the, um, some of the extension products that we offer from resulting from the research in my lab. Um, I've been interested in um, invasive species as um, a, a propagator of, of wildlife diseases for quite a while. And so um, we'll, um, we'll go through some of those today. So, so as promised, I thought I would start off with wild pigs because um, they really define um, a hugely important invasive species that we have here in Florida. There's over a million wild pigs that we guesstimate are here in uh, the state. They occur in every single county in Florida and they've been here for more than 500 years. They're a result of intentional releases um, as well as domestic escapes. Um, and really they are composed today of three different uh, genotypes. So the original Spanish pigs that were brought over by DeSoto and um, others after him. Um, we've had um, people bring uh, Russian boar into the state for hunting purposes. And then there's been lots of escapes, intentional and unintentional, of domestic swine that have uh, feralized as well. So um, that's one part of uh, the story, just how many there are here. So, but before we talk about why diseases can be bad, we should talk a little bit about maybe why diseases can be good, and they are certainly a natural part of the landscape and part of any ecological system. Um, they also represent unique biodiversity. We talk now about, um, in the Anthropocene, an age of loss of biodiversity, the loss of unique parasites with that biodiversity. And this is important because diseases can regulate populations so, of wildlife so they can be maintained at natural, naturally occurring levels. When we start to think about managing wildlife diseases and um, managing them um, in particular in wildlife, we think about when they um, are problems for game species. So we oftentimes um, manage populations of game in order to provide hunting opportunities. 
if those are being impeded, then we might interact in order to increase wildlife population size and try to intervene against that disease. We oftentimes see that very small populations can have dramatic effects when they um, have wildlife diseases come into that. So they can actually threaten endangered species. Sometimes when those wildlife diseases come into contact with our domestic animals, including livestock or even companion animals like dogs and cats, we become concerned. And then of course, when wildlife diseases are shared with humans, which are called zoonotic diseases, um, we become, um, concerned as well. Um, also, when there are exotic diseases that come into the system that none of these wildlife popula uh, populations have seen before, so they are all, all very susceptible, that can cause things like um, pandemics that um, can rapidly change ecosystems due to those wildlife diseases. So speaking of exotic diseases and exotic uh, species, um, one of the things my lab is interested in is how do invasive species create what I call pathogen pollution? So the increase of wildlife diseases that does knock about um, the natural ecosystem and change things in a way that we haven't seen change before. And really you can have pathogen pollution from invasive species by two routes. You can have, in the first example, an invasive species that acquires a local pathogen and then becomes an amplifying host of that pathogen. And a little bit later, I'll give you an example of armadillos and leprosy. The second example that I'll give is that when an invasive species brings new pathogens into the system. And the example of that is um, plague. So um, around the 1850s, when um, there was massive immigration into San Francisco Bay because that was the gold rush, we saw lots of boats coming in from China to bring in workers to build railroads. Those boats had old world rats on them, black rats and Norway rats, which are um, one of the component of sylvatic plague or bubonic plague. So they are the rodent that carries the flea, that carries Yersinia pestis, which is that bacteria. Those rats left the ship and those fleas jumped onto native rodents and infected those native rodents. And so a, a new sylvatic cycle began. And since the 1850s, sylvatic plague has marched eastward across the United States. And so it has settled now in the Great Plains and has really vastly changed the ecosystem of uh, the grassland prairie dog ecosystem. Prairie dogs have um, no um, resistance to this disease and so it absolutely decimates this species. So when we think about wildlife diseases and as um, people who are interested in looking for new incursions of wildlife diseases or changes in the disease ecology, one of the things we do is conduct surveillance, very similarly to what we might do for looking for and monitoring for invasive species. So just to make sure we're all on the same page, surveillance is the collection, analysis, and interpretation of data on the prevalence or the characteristic of a pathogen. And so we can think of multiple different collection strategies of those types of data that are employed regularly for disease monitoring. <clears throat> and so the first one is passive surveillance, and that's opportunistic collection of samples. It tends to be the cheapest way to collect samples um, because it doesn't require that you actively go out and look for things. You rely on things like the general public or veterinarians or other people to bring you samples. And so for instance, the example that I have here is the way um, Fish and, uh, uh, Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission monitors for the incursion of chronic wasting disease is by asking the public to report sick skinny deer. They also collect samples from at hunter check stations um, of lymph nodes to test for chronic wasting disease as well. So that's a passive system. It's great because you can get a lot of samples. What's not so great about it is you don't 
you tend not to have a lot of control over where those samples are taken or oftentimes the quality of those samples. So they could, if it's roadkill, it could have been sitting on the road for quite a while before you get a chance to collect it, which might compromise the quality of that sample. We can also think of active surveillance. That's another type of collection strategy where you actually have targeted collection of samples. The USDA APHIS Wildlife Service does active surveillance for diseases of wild pigs. And so in this middle picture, you can see they use these large traps that trap whole sounders of pigs at a time. They do this at very targeted locations so that they can cover the whole state and have a good sense of what's happening around the state. Then they actively um, draw blood from every animal, and then they test for a, a huge variety of pathogens. Right now, I think it's up to eight different pathogens. So things that we know are here already, things like pseudorabies virus and influenza um, and toxoplasma, but also for things that we don't want to come in, like African swine fever, hoof and mouth disease, or classic swine fever. And then, Florida and other places too have very strong sentinel surveillance programs. And that's using a proxy species for sampling the pathogen. So the prime example of that I think in Florida is the use of sentinel chickens for looking for arboviruses within the state. So um, the Mosquito Control District places live chickens throughout the state and then draws blood samples from them regularly looking for Eastern equine encephalitis, uh, Zika virus, dengue, malaria, they have a whole suite of arboviruses that they look for that gives them an early warning system for when they think these diseases are going to become a problem in other populations, so, right? They're not worried about what's happening in the chicken. What they're worried about is if Triple E is going to kill people or horses or birds. And then the other example I have is there is a worldwide surveillance network of uh, waterfowl for avian influenza. So we've talked a little bit about how we might survey for pathogens, but let's talk a little bit too about the decision-making process for wildlife disease management. When do you leave it alone? When do you try to do something about it? And so there's lots of different, um, um, very prescribed ways that agencies go about this. They might first identify the hazard that they want to try and manage, do a risk assessment of that, then conduct some risk management, and then maybe communicate how that happened. I'm just gonna talk right now about the risk management portion, just to drive home the point that, that there's lots of different efforts that you can put into it. The minimal amount of effort would be to do nothing, perhaps. Perhaps you would try to do some prevention or some control, or maybe even eradication, but as you can see, these have increasing costs, although I would argue that ultimately the do nothing in the end might make things more expensive because sometimes eradication ultimately becomes the most expensive option. And if you do nothing, then perhaps you have to get to this point where you can't even eradicate, right? We don't even talk about eradication of wild pigs in Florida anymore because it is much too monumental of a task. So that brings us to the topic of wild pigs um, and what sort of uh, native and invasive pathogens that they bring with them. So what are the potential and realized threats of feral swine diseases to Florida? And I'll talk about different components of that. So threats to the livestock industry and food security, um, public health and emerging diseases that they can cause there, as well as uh, the threat that they pose to threatened and endangered wildlife in Florida. So pigs are one of those mammals, not unlike bats, that can harbor an amazing number of pathogens and seemingly are, uh, do not always die of them themselves. So they can harbor up to 45 known pathogens Pathogens that can be transmitted to people and are deadly to people, things like brucellosis, toxoplasmosis, lepto, Japanese encephalitis, influenza pseudorabies, 
They can also transmit pathogens to hunting companion animals or our cats and dogs, things like lepto and pseudorabies. They can transmit things to wildlife and have impacts on wildlife species. And then of course they can transmit diseases to our livestock. I have a picture of a pig here, but also to cattle as well. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that top one, African swine fever in just a minute. So <clears throat> because there are, is this huge variety of diseases that pigs can transmit, I just wanna show you this slide to drive home the point that no disease is created equal, right? Every pathogen has different pathogen biology, different ways that they're transmitted through the environment, different exposure routes when they expose other animals to them. So we can't fit any one pathogen into a nice tidy box. Everything behaves really differently. So for instance, toxoplasma, which is a disease that we would consider endemic or native to Florida, really gets amplified and moved around by feral swine. Um, and it's this complicated transmission system between cats and feral swine and rodents and wildlife. Um, and it can be transmitted through water as well. So there are multiple different ways that people can get it. While something like Japanese encephalitis, which is not here, and would be considered a foreign exotic disease were it to come here, is a classic arbovirus disease that can move between feral swine, waterfowl, and these mosquitoes. So just to give you a sense of, of that there are many different ecologies for these different pathogens and how they interact with pigs. So my lab has done a fair bit of research on pseudorabies virus, and in fact, in multiple herpes viruses that infect wildlife because they have such a peculiar and interesting um, lifestyle. So um, herpes viruses are uh, deadly to carnivores and humans. If you had asked me that question a month ago, or maybe two months ago, I would have said that, that pseudorabies virus actually isn't a, a human disease. Um, but there have been some studies published very recently that show that indeed pseudorabies virus is um, a human pathogen as well. It causes an encephalitis, a swelling of the brain, um, which is very difficult to diagnose the reason for. Usually, that encephalitis has caused a swelling and the virus has cleared and your body is still dealing with the results of that swelling before you get diagnosed with what caused it. So nearly 60% of all viral encephalitises that humans contract remain unknown. We never know what the virus is that does it. So that's why things like pseudorabies virus have not, have not been known until very recently to be a pathogen of humans. Interestingly, throughout the United States, so this map shows you where pseudorabies virus is present in pig populations. So throughout the United States, pseudorabies, are, sorry, wild pigs occur in 47 of our 50 states. Um, and wild pigs are about 40% positive for pseudorabies virus. So if you are a hunter, it is very likely that you are coming into contact with pigs that um, may be positive for pseudorabies. And I would just point out that this woman who is handling this dead pig is not wearing gloves. Her dog, she's used dogs to, um, to hunt this animal, which is great. There's lots of dog hunters, um, uh, uh, dogs that hunt pigs in Florida, but we know that the virus can kill both dogs and people. So there's some things that, um, that people can do to protect themselves, and I'll talk about that in just a bit. So pseudorabies virus is a threat to global food production. There has been, um, in the last six or seven years, the emergence of a very virulent pseudorabies virus in China, meaning that it kills more pigs than um, historical strains of pseudorabies virus does. And the, the recent report of six um, pig workers that died from pseudorabies virus-induced encephalitis really drives home the point that pseudorabies virus is something a little different than we thought it was. I think, too, with the new coronavirus-19 that we have been seeing circulating worldwide, 
really also drives home the point that global trade can really move viruses around quickly. And it has certainly done so with pseudo rabies virus because we move a lot of pigs around within the United States and globally. Pseudo rabies virus is the third highest known cause of death in Florida panthers. Um, my slide here says 9% of mortalities from pseudo rabies virus. Those are ones that are actually 100% diagnostically confirmed. There are an additional um, probably 20% of those deaths that are suspect pseudo rabies virus, but we could never recover the virus out of those animals. Again, they died of an encephalitis before we could get to the virus. But here's how they do it. Here is a picture of a pig being chased down by a panther for dinner. Um, if you're wondering what the what, number one and two deaths of panthers are, it's intraspecific aggression, so male-on-male -male aggression, males killing other males, and then of course being hit by vehicles. But it's certainly the largest pathogen that we see in um, recovered dead panthers, more so than rabies, more so than feline leukemia. And that comes entirely from eating wild pigs as prey. And we know that pseudo rabies virus is spreading in Florida. These data come from USDA APHIS Wildlife Services from those um, surveys that I was showing you earlier in the presentation. So um, we see both an increase in the distribution of the virus, but also in the intensity, the number of pigs that um, are infected within locations. So um, it is increasing, as is the number of pigs in Florida. And we have seen, as I showed you, an increase in the number of animals exposed through time. So exposure meaning that um, they are showing antibodies to this virus, meaning that they are likely carriers. So what's the take home message about pseudo rabies virus in pigs? I would just like to remind you that wild pigs can transmit numerous diseases to people, domestic animals and wildlife. I think our Florida agencies are starting to realize that and have done actually a very good job of self organizing amongst the different agencies to come together and recognize that even though they might have different mandates, so Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission might be mandated to create hunting opportunities with pig. It's the second most popular game animal in Florida, second only to white-tailed deer. While the Department of Environmental Protection wants to get rid of every pig that they possibly can. And those two entities can, can control wild lands that are adjacent to each other. So getting those um, entities to talk to one another is really starting to happen now so that these can be these issues can be managed a bit more holistically. So in panther breeding grounds, we really advocate that efforts should be taken to increase surveillance and, um, and um, change the way perhaps that pigs are managed in areas where we know that there are panthers. And then use protective uh, um, personal equipment when dressing hunted animals. Stick on a pair of gloves when you're gonna gut out a pig. I will show you in a minute, it's not just pseudo rabies um, that these animals carry that can um, affect humans. Um, and so that's really important. And then every year we see lots of hunting dogs die from pseudo rabies um, and it is absolutely not curable. As soon as that animal is showing symptoms of that disease, it is as good as dead. And so you really need to be careful that you don't feed any of those hunting dogs uh, raw pig meat. And then of course, if you're going to cook that animal, make sure that you clean all of those surfaces and um, cook that meat well. So the other pathogen in wild pigs, particularly in Florida, that people need to be aware of is Brucella suis. This, this is a bacterial pathogen, unlike the virus that I just told you about. And in humans, it causes brucellosis, which is a bacterial infection. It targets the liver and tends to create a lot of liver damage before symptoms 
even on set. And so um, it can be a very insidious bacterial infection. And it is the number one zoonotic disease that we see that's not a tick-borne disease in Floridians. So we see probably a dozen cases of brucellosis each year, almost exclusively in um, hunters. Um, this brucella can also infect cattle as well, um, and it looks very much like brucella abortus, which is a reportable disease. And so it really complicates cattle testing because all cattle that are gonna be moved about have to be tested for brucella abortus and that test cross-reacts with brucella suis. It is also a very um, prevalent disease. Between 40 and 50% of all wild pigs in Florida test positive for brucella suis. So it's a 50-50 chance whether you're gonna get a clean pig or not when you hunt them. And so you. Uh, hunters should always be considering that when they're, they're handling game meat. And this map shows the number of human cases um, around the state, and I believe these data are from 2017. So this is quite a common zoonotic disease throughout the United States. This is um, data from the uh, Florida Morbidity and Mortality Reports that come out every year. And so again, as you can see, about a dozen cases in Floridians each year. So just some things to take away about brucella. Um, again, I cannot stress enough that wild pigs carry diseases um, and should be managed appropriately. Uh, cattle can be misdiagnosed and we see cattle and pigs coming into contact all the time. And if that happens in, in people's cattle, it will prevent legal transportation if they test positive for brucella abortus. Um, and then once again, just driving home the point that using personal protective equipment, PPE, when dressing hunted animals is, is really, really important. So um, swine influenza has really been on the rise. Um, people can get pig flu, so this isn't necessarily the flu that we see circulating around the globe every year. Um, this is um, a pig-specific disease, but we see more than 300 cases a year in the U.S. from pigs, and this almost always occurs in people who are handling pigs in facilities, but increasingly we're seeing a lot of um, uh, fair attendees becoming ill and having small epizootics occur at these events. And so um, most state boards of animal health now um, have recommendations for people whenever they go to fairs and are showing pigs and they uh, do not eat or drink or sleep in animal areas. Don't bring anything that you're going to put in your mouth into animal areas. If you are ill, stay out of barns because people can transmit flu to pigs and then it can start circulating in pigs. And then always um, use good hygiene methods, right? And wash your hands after you've visited any uh, livestock animal area. So the role of wild pigs in flu pandemics is pretty incredible. Um, so <clears throat> There can be three distinct types of influenza virus, right? So there are some that are very specific to pigs, some that are very specific to birds, some that are very specific to humans. If all of those strains end up in one individual, then what can happen is that you can create new strains. We call it an antigenic shift. These little colored dots are the, the, the keys that that virus uses to unlock your cells and infect them. And so if that, if your cell has never seen a bird strain before or a pig strain before, then all of a sudden you're very susceptible to that influenza. And so we can think of them as these real mixing vessels. The only thing I wanted to take you to take away from this is just the amazing influenza surveillance and response system that we have globally. Each one of these triangles is an influenza center throughout the world. Um, and that is because we see a lot of influenza around the world and there is so much variability in that influenza, right? So each one of these different colors in the pie chart is a different virus subtype. 
So just a little take home about influenza. So these wild pigs can act as mixing vessels for influenza. So if you keep pigs with your ducks and you handle them every day, you all of a sudden have a mixing vessel in your uh, homestead. If you show pigs at fairs, follow the best safety practices that are common at most of these fairs. And then of course, get vaccinated for flu every year, right? It changes every year and it's important that uh, we as humans create herd immunity for ourselves. So future threats are things like African swine fever. Last October, I was at the US Animal Health Association meeting that is a collection of all the state veterinarians in the United States and talking about upcoming diseases. Um, and people at that meeting were not talking about if African swine fever comes to the US, they were talking about when African swine fever comes to the US. Um, and my concern is, yes, it will be devastating if it gets into domestic swine populations, but at least people have control over those populations. It would be incredibly changing to our entire economy if it got into feral swine. It can be directly transmitted. It can be transmitted by ticks. It's incredibly resilient. It can live in soil for years. It can live in cured meat. So if you bring in cured pork sausage, there is a potential that that could have live African swine fever virus in it. Um, one quarter of the world's domestic swine have been culled to reduce this disease. So we're talking about hundreds of millions of animals that have been culled. Um, it, ha it is in the domestic swine population in China and in Russia, but it is also now in the uh, boar population throughout Eastern Europe and Russia. Um, and it has been marching steadily westward. This is particularly concerning because there is such a huge global trade in live pigs throughout the United States. We see millions of live pigs moved around the globe daily. And uh, the US pork producer president at this UHAA meeting that I was at, she said that there are 1 million live pigs a day that are moved within the US. That means 1 million live pigs on our highways every single day. So if virus came in, if one of these pathogens came in, the ability for it to spread rapidly um, is certainly there. So the take home message is really here. This is true of lots of other foreign animal diseases um, and that they certainly can threaten our US livestock industries, particularly in Florida. We have a lot of populations that own domestic pigs that actually breed them with feral swine. So there is very poor biosecurity in some of our um, smaller domestic herds um, that really create a huge potential for disease transmission between wild and domestic populations. Okay. So I'm going to transition just a little bit and sort of wind up the last few minutes of this talk with talking about other invasive species in Florida and some of the pathogens that they can carry. So it is kind of timely that, um, that this talk came about. There has been a lot of press lately about some rhesus macaques that have showed up in Jacksonville, Florida. Um, these are most likely dispersing subadult males from the Silver Springs population. They get kicked out when they get of a certain age um, to go find their um, a new troop, but there are no other troops, so they just keep wandering further and further away. Um, they've been found as far away as Tallahassee and Sarasota from here, so we know that they can move um, rapidly and far. Um, we've not seen any other established troops other than in Silver Springs and the, the very outlying areas of that. These populations, though, are growing at an 11% rate. 
annual rate of growth. That is a huge rate of growth. Um, and so if they aren't yet, they soon will be in a neighborhood near you. So these macaques share traits of other great invaders. So they're omnivorous, they'll eat anything. Um, they decimate um, avian populations. They are, are particularly keen on eggs. So um, one of my colleagues, Steve Johnson, um, has conducted a study that shows that they readily consume native avian fauna eggs. They're habitat generalists in their native ranges in Asia. They can live from Southeast Asia up into the Himalayas. They're both arboreal, but they can also be terrestrial. So they're incredibly plastic in their behavior. And as I mentioned, they decimate native fauna. They're also considered extreme agricultural pests and known pathogen polluters as well. So a few years back, some colleagues and myself um, actually sampled the Silver Springs population of uh, macaques and we're able to show that they do carry um, the Maccasine herpes virus 1, more colloquially called herpes B virus. This is what we call a low risk but high consequence pathogen, something like rabies virus. So you have a very low probability of contracting it, but if you contract it, you have a very high probability of dying. So there's only been 50 documented cases in humans all of which have occurred in laboratory settings, but 50% of those were fatal. And so it's a very interesting conundrum that we've seen documented cases in the lab, but we have never seen a documented death or illness in a human due to wild exposure. And we don't know if that's because there are differences in the actual uh, types that are circulating between the labs and, and wild, or if it's again comes back to this idea that people who die of encephalitis very rarely have the virus that killed them identified. So that is just a huge unknown at this point. Um, we have had some movement by Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission. They've put up signs that say, don't feed the monkeys. But I think larger um, things need to be done. These populations absolutely need to be controlled. Um, they were controlled until about 2012, um, which is why we've only very recently seen this expansion. Um, Fish and Wildlife Commission had contracted trappers to, trap at, to uh, keep these populations low. PETA stepped in and made a ruckus and um, Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission and Department of Environmental Protection then decided to no longer um, uh, involve trappers, and that's when the population started exploding. So just to show you how the, the herpes virus is transmitted, it's a directly transmitted virus. So um, the virus, um, hangs out in the body and when an animal gets stressed, it, it's what we call it reactivates and the, the animal begins to shed. So this is a lifelong infection that these um, monkeys have. It doesn't make them particularly ill. It is analogous to the cold sore herpes virus that humans get and when you get stressed, it reactivates and you feel a little bad, you get cold sores. Um, but you are actively shedding virus, both through your mouth and for these guys, also um, through their uh, reproductive tract. So um, it can be um, shed both in feces and urine, as well as it can be sexually transmitted. So we were able to, um, to collect and show that there was live virus in the saliva of these monkeys in Silver Springs. Um, and we're very curious about the prospect of live virus being in feces in Silver Spring State Park because you go to that park on any given Sunday and you can see a lot of feces in areas that people walk around in, like children's slides. Um, so the take home message from this is that macaques in Silver Spring State Park 
I think, represent a real and well-defined public health threat. When I was interviewed when this story had a lot of press, my number one story was never feed wildlife. It's never a good idea. Habituating wildlife to people is never a good idea. Um, and then finally, that animal rights groups should not be setting the agenda for conservation and public health policy. So back to leprosy. This is such an interesting story. Um, so the number of cases in humans has been um, rising in Florida. So again, this is the number of human cases in Florida taken from the Florida Morbidity and Mortality Report. Um, and we have seen this sort of steady increase in the number of leprosy cases. So leprosy is a bacterial pathogen found on the skin and surface of um, uh, armadillos. It is a disease that can be contracted by people, but it's typically only immunocompromised people that contract this, this pathogen. So the numbers tend to be quite low, um, and it and it's certainly uh, hits a certain population. But nonetheless, we have seen this sort of dramatic rise in number of cases. And it turns out that there's an interesting story behind this. So the number of cases started before um, 2010, um, but really in surveillance of um, leprosy in armadillos, it really hadn't been found in either Georgia or Florida prior to 2010. So the incidence must have been very low. After about that time, we started seeing um, the cases rise in Florida in armadillos, and then we have now seen an increase in people. There was a really cool study that looked at the genetic signature of the leprosy pathogen in armadillos, and then in the cases in people, and then looking at leprosy around the world in people. And it turns out that people gave leprosy to these armadillos, and then the armadillos amplified it, right? It spread around these populations of armadillos. And now so many armadillos have this pathogen that they're giving it back to people. So that's the case of the spill back of a native pathogen into a invasive species. Um, so very interesting uh, ecology of, of this disease. So the routes of exposure, um, typically we would have thought that it's uh, almost exclusively from handling armadillos. People skin armadillos to make artifacts. People eat armadillos. And people also handle them because they can be garden pests as well. Um, the symptoms of leprosy are a loss of feeling in hands and feet. You can have thick drying skin and muscle weakness and large nerves and very rarely we see it in eyes as well. Um, but again, this is typically only seen in immunocompromised people. Very interestingly, the, a large proportion of the cases in the last few years when they've been interviewed by Florida Department of Health, these people have not come into direct contact with armadillos, but surprisingly, a large number of them were avid gardeners which suggests that there is some residual um, uh, of this bacteria in soil that people are coming in contact with, and perhaps it's being transmitted that way. There's been no definitive study that, shown, that shows that it can live in the soil and be transmitted that way, but just this um, indirect evidence from people who've become infected. So avoid contact with armadillos unless you are an avid armadillo eater. Um, so, but if you must, please wash your hands, um, follow PPE methods, cook your armadillo meat thoroughly, wear gardening gloves, um, and wash your hands after you've gardened. And there's more information there on leprosy if you're interested. So the take home messages, I've just really kind of gone through them, but you know, I, this last one, is something that I should probably have said for all of them. And this is what I tell all of my wildlife students, all of the hunters that I come into contact with that I do extension programming for, 
if you're someone who regularly is outdoors or handles wildlife, make sure that you tell your doctor that if you present to a doctor feeling poopy. I mean, most of these wildlife diseases have a very similar set of symptoms. I have a headache, I have aches, and I don't feel very good. They're just sort of generalized flu-like symptoms. Um, and so giving your doctor the most information you have, I was bit by a tick, I was hunting a pig, can really help them diagnose what you might have quickly. And that's it for my formal presentation, and I'm more than happy to take any questions. Awesome, thank you so much, um, Dr. Wisely. So yeah, at this point, um, if you have any questions, you have a few options. You can unmute your, um, your audio, or uh, feel free to also type a question into the chat box here. And so I'll give folks a few moments to, um, to populate that if you have any questions. Um, I guess I'll, I'll start and just wondering if um, your lab has had any um, information or, or is doing any work on those recent cases of um, neurological issues in the Florida Panthers. No, you know, I've asked a couple of people at Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission if there's been any updates on that lately. And I really have not heard anything other uh, new about it. I think the problem is, my understanding is, that they don't have any bodies. It's, it's all information that they're getting from these camera traps. It's, it's animals presenting with these extreme neurological conditions, both panthers as well as um, bobcats, but they don't have any animals where they can collect pathogens from or, lo or look for toxicity. Um, and, and so that's where it stands as far as I know. But yeah, that's really, really interesting and, and it's tragic because it's occurring in multiple places. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so we had a question. Is there any reports of trichinosis in feral swine in Florida? Of trichinosis? Um, in feral swine, that's a good question that I don't have a ready answer for. Um, I can say that there are no reports in humans that I've seen in the last few years looking back through the morbidity and mortality reports. Um, but it's certainly something that they could carry, absolutely, and transmit to domestic swine um, in areas where they have poor biosecurity. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Another question. Um, you indicated that PETA can be prob problematic for managing invasive wildlife species. Do you have a suggested strategy for dealing with PETA interventions? And also, are feral cats an issue in spreading disease? So kind of a two-part there. Yeah, so yeah, I mean, I, it's, that's a really tough question. I, you know, I, I blame it all on PETA, and that's, that's not fair. Um, there are lots of other animal rights organizations, some of which resort to much worse task tactics uh, or tactics that are criminal, in fact. Um, my graduate student, sorry, my uh, postdoc who did the um, work on Silver Springs macaques in, um, in Silver Springs had death threats. They published, there were people who published her home address because she was, in their eyes, threatening that population of animals. You know, so how do you work with terrorists? I don't know the answer to that. Um, I'm very disappointed to see that Fish and Wildlife Commission has not had the backbone to stand up to them. They seem to punt the issue. Oh, and then the second issue, feral cats. Um, so yes, they, they can spread lots of diseases. So um, they are the number one domestic animal species that transmits, um, that can expose humans to rabies. So every year we see several hundred humans that have been exposed to rabies via cats. Now those people don't die, but there's a very good infrastructure for people who have um, been exposed to rabies, um, getting post-exposure vaccination, namely. Um, 
But cat scratch fever is um, a bacterial infection that actually my bioscientist got, and I was shocked at how long of a course of antibiotics and how aggressive that bacteria is in the scratch that she got. Um, and then there are um, lots of hookworms and roundworms that can be transmitted to people's soil and then people can get them there. So um, they're, they are definitely a huge zoonotic disease issue in our state. Thank you. Um, and so we also had an additional question about the macaques. Um, is there a plan for um, managing them? Um, and maybe just mentioning, you know, what, what options people have for managing them, if any. Yeah. So, I mean, I am not a representative of, Fish and Wild, of uh, Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission. I have heard them bantering about a few ideas. I mean, they, they did have a task force that met for some time, but that was about 18 months ago, and I haven't heard any recommendations come out from them. They're certainly not managing them at this point. Um, but they were talking about setting up a sanctuary, so actually removing them and keeping them alive. They were talking about euthanizing them, so culling the population. Um, they've talked about um, contraceptives. Um, and the, the graduate student who then became a postdoc, Jane Anderson, did some really lovely modeling work to show that you would have to sterilize 80% of the population every year just to get a decline in the population. And if you've ever tried to trap a Reese's macaque, they are smart and really difficult to capture. So that, to, in my mind, that does not seem like it's a feasible option, even though it seems on the outside to be something that might be a compromise for all groups. Mm -hmm. And my understanding of um, if the animals show up on private property, um, similar to other animals like pythons and tegus and monitors is that they're not protected. Um, they're not protected wildlife as a non-native species, um, but all animals are protected by anti-cruelty laws. So if they are on private property, you can, you know, call a trapper or dispatch them in accordance with humane, um, you know, practices. Um, but on, but as, as Dr. Wisely is mentioning on public lands, um, really FWC is the lead kind of on coming up with a, and implementing a, a plan for that. Yeah, thank you. Um, so it looks like um, any other questions, please. Um, Dr. Wisely's email is there um, and you can always also just shoot um, any questions to me and I can carry on them over. So um, thanks again. Dr. Wisely for joining us today. That's such an interesting and important um, presentation. I just want to highlight a comment, um, just adding that, you know, this is important information for, for gardeners. And so um, good information for folks to be able to share with their um, communities as well. Um, so thank you so much. And um, with that, we will go into our uh, updates for Florida Weed Wrangle Week. Um, so as hopefully everybody knows, it is National Invasive Species Awareness Week, and here in Florida, it's Florida Weed Wrangle Awareness Week, or Florida Weed Wrangle Week. And so we have um, currently 25 weed wrangle events across the state. Um, six of those are during the week. 16 of those are occurring um, this coming Saturday, and actually three of those are on March 7th. We've had some groups that just um, for varying uh, issues and circumstances needed to push them back a little bit. So we're gonna, we're, we're including those as well. Um, we also have additional events going on across the state. Um, some have already occurred this week, others are coming up and you can see that list there. Um, in the comment box, as I mentioned earlier, um, are some links. So the first link is actually to our Weed Wrangle Week website where this map that you see here is interactive and it shows you um, Kind of it gives you the information on all these events. The green trees, um, the events that are green, those are all the Lee Ringle events that are occurring on Saturday. Um, the blue trees are events that are occurring throughout this week. 
the yellow circles indicate an educational opportunity and the brown circles indicate um, an animal opportunity. So the two brown circles are some North African python surveys that are going on in South Florida, as well as the FWC Exotic Pet Amnesty Day occurring at Naples Zoo this Saturday. Um, so a lot of events across the state, hopefully everyone is able to find um, a vol volunteer opportunity near them. And please consider sharing this via your social media um, and, and letting people know um, what's out there. Also, just really quickly to highlight what's going on on the national level, um, there are meetings and um, information being shared at the Hill this week. Um, there's also, if you go to the NISA website, which is the second link in the chat box, um, there are some tools and resources for communicating with your policymakers. There's a lot of good information there. They are also hosting a webinar series this week, and so here's the list. Of course, we are at, um, we're in the middle of their Wednesday uh, webinar. I wanted to highlight that um, tomorrow's webinar, Investigating the Health Effects of Glyphosate, um, that's a, a hot button topic that a lot of us here in Florida deal with um, just for use in natural areas. And so um, this should be a really interesting one. I believe it's Cornell University um, researchers. Um, and so looking forward to, to hearing that, um, that research. Next up, um, just want to remind folks that the FLEPSI conference is coming up March 25th through the 27th. Um, early registration for FLEPSI ends this Friday. So if you're planning to attend and you haven't registered, um, go ahead and do that. The rates are a little lower for early registration. Um, and I believe there's a free long sleeve uh, t-shirt involved as well. So the links um, are here. They're also in the chat box there to register um, and as well as to reserve a room at the conference location. Also, the annual SISMA workshop um, that occurs with the FLEPC meeting is on March 24th. The agenda's here. Um, please go to Eventbrite and register if you plan to attend that. Um, it's, it's no cost to register there. That just gives us an idea of who's planning to attend, as well as we have some questions to contribute to the discussions um, during the workshop. So, reminder, make sure you get your registration in for FLEPC this week. And, um, and I'll also be sending out an email reminder about the SISMA workshop uh, probably next week. Um, just want to share with folks uh, additional upcoming events um, and a reminder that you can always find what's going on with SISMAs around the state on our calendar on our website. This link is also in the chat box. Um, so some great things coming up. As I mentioned, all the stuff going on this week. Um, lots of good work days coming up in March and April, um, highlighting the International Wild Hog Conference, um, that's kind of pertains to today's presentation, is actually going to be in Jacksonville, Florida this year. So this is a conference that occurs around the world, um, and that's on April 9th, uh, 6th through 9th. Um, and if you want further details on that, again, just visit our website and go to the April month calendar and you can find the website for an information about this conference. Um, and then also May 16th through 23rd will be Florida Invasive Species Awareness Week in partnership with National Invasive Species Awareness Week part two. Um, more information coming on that as well. Um, just a reminder of our SISMA call schedule. We actually will not have a call next month. Um, many of us will be at FLEPSI. Um, and so no call in March. On Wednesday, we have Shelley, uh, Shelby with the UF IFAS Center of Aquatic and Invasive Plants, um, and she's gonna give us a social media boot camp. So for those SISMAs or just agency folks who wanna learn how to use social media more effectively to promote your efforts and organizations, um, be sure to tune in for that. And then in July, we're gonna hear from um, Dr. Carrie Mentier, at UFIFIS with an update on Brazilian pepper biological controls. Um, as many of you know, they are starting to be released across the state, so it'll be a good time to check in and hear, you know, what, what's the first uh, results that are coming out of that. And stay tuned um, for additional details on May, June, and the rest of the year for our calls. Um, my contact information, if you have any questions about any of that um, stuff in the quick overview, please feel free to reach out to me um, anytime. And lastly, um, just remember that 
Our calls are on the fourth Wednesday of every month at 1.30 and past calls are available online. So um, this, this is the last link in your chat box as well. If you click here, there's a button on that page that will take you to a listing of all the past calls um, that are available. It takes a few days to get them up. So for this call, um, it should be available sometime midweek next week. Um, and again, follow us on all the socials for invasive species issues going on around Florida and FISP related events. Um, we are on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. So thanks again, everybody, so much for joining us today. Um, a special and huge thank you to Dr. Samantha Wisely so for presenting this, the information. And um, it's always great just to um, chat with everybody. So thanks again, have a great NISA, and we will talk to you next month.